Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. I'm excited about what God's going to do uh, in, this, uh, in this message today. And I just encourage you, man, will you posture your heart to receive what God has for your life? And so Matthew chapter 14, you've got your Bibles up, get your Bibles up. You're taking notes. I always love Jeff over here. He's a note taker. And so how many know the devil get distracted from your mind, but he can't take it off paper uh, or digital, right? And so make a, make a iPhone uh, note or bear app or whatever you're using, Android. Uh, I'm not quite sure what y'all use on that thing, but it's okay. You know, use uh, Facebook status, whatever you can. But Matthew chapter 14, immediately. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and to go before him to the other side. And so while he dismissed the crowds, and I love this, as we're talking about distractions, right? Sometimes you got to dismiss the crowds and get alone. And he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone without any tasers. I mean, we were here last week. But the boat, by this time, somebody's like, tasers? Yeah, this is how we are at Avenue Church, you know? But the boat, uh, so when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat where the disciples were by this time was a long way from the land. It was beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. You know, sometimes distractions can feel like that. Right. Just beating you from every which side and, and you, you, you dismiss those distractions and guess what? You're distracted somewhere else. Yeah. And so it was beaten by the winds against them. And, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea, walking on water. We've only seen Chris Angel kind of do that, <laughs> but it wasn't like it was boxes, all right? We, we, this, is a, this is incredible. My wife just shook her head no. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. It's not, what's going on here? And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I. Don't be afraid. But Peter answered him, and I love Peter, right? Like, like for me, honestly, that, I would have been good with that. Jesus is walking on water. Like, I've never seen that before. We've never seen that before. And all of a sudden he goes, take heart. It is me. It's Jesus. Don't be afraid, right? I'd be like, oh, okay. Praise God. But this is what Peter says. Peter says, Lord, if it is you. I'm telling you, Peter represents the average Christian, right? Lord, is this you? Jesus is like, I'm walking on water, you know? But Jesus, if this is you, tell me to come to you on the water. You know, Peter made a lot of mistakes, but my goodness, he got to walk on water himself. If Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on water and he came to Jesus. He got out of the boat, he walked on water and he came to Jesus. I want to paint this picture for you today. He, he got out of the boat, there's winds and waves and storms and distractions. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand. He took a hold of him saying, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. The wind ceased. I'm gonna pray real quick and I'm excited what God's gonna do today. Man, I love celebrating our kids. I love that we are not only uh, multicultural, or multi-generational, but we honor every single generation uh, in this house today. And uh, I'm just excited what God's going to do. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Thank you for this word, Father. I pray, uh, man, write it on the tablets of our hearts. Now, Father, I pray today, may we be forever changed. Father, I pray when we walk out of this place today, we walk out with your spirit. Father, we walk out with the fruits of the spirit, but also, Father, we walk out with some traction for our lives so that we can continue to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make an eternal difference. In your name, I pray, and may the wind cease and keep it at 75 balmy degrees all summer long in Las Vegas, Nevada. And everybody shout it. Amen. amen and amen. All right, let's get going here. Uh, John 10, 10 is our, our, our main scripture, and it's the thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to distract. Say distract. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, don't distract me. All right, don't distract me. Turn your other neighbor and say, are you on Facebook or Instagram right now? All right. All right. And if you are, take Jeremy at J-E-R-E-M-Y-B-O-S-M-A, please. All right. And so, uh, thief only comes to destroy and distract, but I have come, and this is Jesus Christ, King Jesus, that I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. And our key phrase for this series is your life is too valuable. Come on, church. Your calling is too great, and your God is too good 
for you to be distracted by things that do not matter. Right? But here's the thing about Peter. I really been hustled over this going, okay, um, Lord, I thought it was good to marry Martha. Why are we in Peter? Why are we, why are we hanging out here? And I really felt like the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. As, as Peter was walking on the water, he saw the winds and the waves, but he was already doing something pretty miraculous. He was doing something pretty miraculous. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but I found out that distractions sink us every single day. Every single moment, distractions will sink us. And for some of you in this room, if you see this little space right here, you're distracted. <laughs> Distractious. Distractions sink us every single day. <laughs> We're having fun today. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Here's kind of what I want you to deal with. And I want you to sit in this, in the, in the context of this story. There's a storm, there's winds and waves. These fishermen are professionals. They've done this. It's in the middle of the night between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. This is the, the best time for them to go out and cast their, their, their nets and catch fish. So storms are coming out of their way. They've been in storms before, but there was something about this storm that caused the professionals to be afraid. And so as there, uh, Peter says, come, Peter got out of the boat. When they walked on the water, they came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. Here's what's interesting to me. Jesus didn't say, calm the storm and then come walk on on the water. Jesus said, it's stormy and it's distracting, but I need you to come out on the water anyways. Jesus didn't say, well, let me make perfect conditions for you to take a step of faith. And so here's what it is. Distractions will always exist, but managing them is our responsibility. Distractions, there will always be storms of life, but we have to understand how do I manage my distractions? And this is what we learned last week. We learned you can't call something the distraction unless you know what it's distracting you from. So the winds of the waves was distracting Peter from sinking and drowning and dying. So he had a, he, he, had, he had the what? But I really want you to know, for us here as a Christ follower, when we leave this room here today and we say, I love this series, this is wonderful, but Pastor Jeremy, I don't want this just to be another sermon series I hear and it goes in my ears and outside, the, you know, out the other ear. I want this to be a core value in my life. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what is distracting you from. So what is the what? And I want you to know the what is the value. The what is the value. So I want to ask you today, not what, what, what's distracting you? That's what we asked last week. I want to ask you today, what do you value? Right. What do you value? Value, values are a compass in our life. Right. Values really determine our actions and, and why we do what we do, why we say what we say, why we think what we think because of values. And here's what a value is, right? Value is how we want to be. Uh, uh, values are what we want to stand for. Values are how we want to relate to the world around us. These are my values. Raise your hand in this room if you've got values. Raise your hand in this room if you've got values. If you don't have values, you're lying, all right? Because every single person has values. Some of your values, like if someone dragged you here, then church really isn't a value. Your value is, I'd rather do this out there than something else. We all have values. We all have a system. I've heard people say, I don't have systems in my life. Yo, you wake up somehow. You brush your teeth somehow. You put food in your body somehow. Guess what? That's your system. So we all have values. Ooh, see that thunder? The winds and the waves. <laughs> so instead of asking, what are you? I have ADHD, so buckle up. The question is, what do you value? But really, if values is how we want to be, my question is, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And this is so interesting. I begin to study distractions, begin to find out distractions are tied in with your values. I'm distracted. Well, what are you distracted from? Well, I'm distracted from this. Well, is that a value in your life? Is it really, is it distraction? Is it attraction? Is it pulling you away from your values or is it pulling you towards your values? And here's an interesting emotionally, uh, uh, emotionally healthy spirituality. Devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, all right? If we chronically neglect our values, here's what happens. If we chronically neglect our values, we become something we're not proud of. 
We become something we're not proud of and our lives feel out of balance and diminished. Ironically, this ugly feeling makes us more likely to seek distractions to escape our dissatisfaction without actually solving the problem. I'm probably gonna have this definition up again later in this message because as we neglect our values, we, we not only, we neglect our values every single time we give into a distraction, but what we, what we give into a distraction, <laughs> we give into, I'm spirit filled, it's 2022, amen? But when we give in to a distraction, right, we neglect our values, but when we neglect our values, we offer distractions to avoid the problem that we currently have, amen? amen. So tractions and distractions, ah! tractions, <laughs> Emma, go ahead, tractions and distractions always begin with a trigger. Yeah. Always begin with a trigger. Distractions <laughs> always begin with a trigger. <laughs> and a trigger, we're moving, huh? And a trigger, is anything. Online audience, it is so much more fun in the house, I promise. <laughs> a trigger is anything that moves you. And we're, we're bombarded with triggers every single day. There's internal triggers, external triggers, but we're triggered. I'm triggered. We're triggered. And so when we get triggered, that trigger can either be traction. It get, I'm, I'm tri- you know, I see something, I go, yes, I set that out so I don't forget. How many do that every single day, right? Or you go, you know what, I, I saw something, like I just wanted to, I wanted to look, I wanted to Google something to understand how this works, and then Google sends me something else, and next thing you know, you're spending five hours learning if, if Bigfoot's real <laughs> on YouTube. And there's many triggers that move us towards tractions or distractions. And it's just the way we built. For example, if I were to say right now, uh, church, um, do not, in Jesus' name, do not think about a polar bear. Do not think about a white polar bear, all right, walking along the river. Uh, maybe, uh, no, don't think about a polar bear, uh, you know, uh, uh, hunting for food or just walking amongst us all. Do not think about a white polar bear. Stop it in Jesus' name. Do not think, how many are thinking about a white polar bear? Right, how many are thinking about a white polar bear? How many are not thinking about a white polar bear? Wow, okay. So those are many, those are, perhaps internal triggers that take place. And I've seen internal triggers take place by our self-talk, by what we think about. I'm currently thinking about this. A lot of times those triggers, uh, man, I've seen in church settings, I've seen it in in my own life in devotion time or or time with Jesus. And those internal triggers distract me away from the things of God as I begin to focus on the winds and the waves. Instead of looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, I spend too much time trying not to think about the things that bring me down, things that condemn me, things that say, oh man, my regret or my guilt or my sin, or oh man, that time I screwed up, or oh, this and that. And there's two greatest thieves in our life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. A thief can be the the thief himself, the enemy, the devourer, the principalities in darkness, but also the thief can be us. They were our biggest critic. And so that's an internal trigger. Do not think about a polar bear. But from here on out, I'm not going to be thinking about a polar bear. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it again. I'm not going to be talking about polar bears again because there's internal triggers, but there's also external triggers. So I'm not going to be talking about Dickett. We're going to move on from, 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 from that animal and we're going to talk about something else. And what happens is there's triggers in your life that cause your mind to be distracted. And so with that, triggers are really cues. And with cues, I, we will always have cues and triggers and distractions, but managing them is our responsibility. And so with that, we have to have rules for cues. Because values actually creates rules. So my first question is, what do you value? And begin to identify what you value. And if you identify what you value, then you now have rules for your triggers. Because if you value nothing, then you're going to accept everything. If you don't have a clear direction for your life, then you're going to accept every distraction that comes your way. And I'm here to tell you, your life is way too valuable. And your calling is way too great. Your God is too good for you to be distracted by things that do not matter. And here's a 
Uh, we have to have rules for cues, right? Values, creates rules. We, we, we know what is allowed and what isn't. I know what's allowed, what is it? When I'm writing a sermon, I know I put my phone on do not disturb. I put, I, I, you know, I turn off, um, you know, I make my computer screen wide and I say, I, I don't welcome anything that's a distraction, but if there's traction, I'm, 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 I allow it in my life. There are things in my life that I have rules for, but I want you to know a rule. A lot of times we, we, we think about the Christian life and I say, you know, the, Bible, the church is just a bunch of rules and regulations. I read God's word, it's just a bunch of don't do this and don't have fun. How many think the, uh, the local church should be the funnest place to be? That's what I think. But rules, according, uh, rules, the, the main word for, the, the root word for rules is actually trellis. So when we say have a trellis in your life, a trellis is a tool that enables a grapevine to get off the ground and to grow upward, becoming more fruitful and becoming more productive. When you have rules for the triggers in your life or rules for the distractions in your life, even rules for traction in your life, you're going to be more fruitful and more productive. And I love this because Jesus didn't say, man, it's about relationship, but we got to have some trellises in our life to help the fruit to grow and to be productive. In John 15, Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the, uh, the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So Jesus is literally going... I'm cutting it off. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, he improves, he puts it in the trellis. And that may, bear, that may bear more fruit. So if I were to end the sermon here and go, you need values, and you write down your values, I want you to write down what do you value in this life? What do you value? But if we were just to leave here today, it has to take another step forward because values need priorities so triggers can be defined. So what do you value? And if you find out what you value, then you'll know how to define some triggers in your life. But values need priorities. Because what if a good thing triggers another good thing? Which good thing comes first? Which value comes first in my life? And so here's just a, a suggestion. Just giving a suggestion here today. Maybe a challenge for some of us in this room. Because this is what we all say, right? Make you look. Pastor Jeremy, faith is number one. I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> and then my family, 100%. My family, like just my family. Just me, myself, and I. Familia. <laughs> right? And then my friends, you know. My, my, and then work. Work is like down here because that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> but for some of us, we go, well, you, you, you know, I, I, I value my family and, and I want them to, to have what I didn't have and, and I didn't have money and things like that. And, and, I, and I'm not saying, I'm, you know, live in your mom's basement and don't make a difference in this world. But what I'm saying is sometimes we, you like that? And, but sometimes we, we put work way up here because we think, we're, 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 we think value, the value of family is actually higher than work, but really work is higher than the value of family. I had to learn a long time ago that, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hustle, even as a pastor, church planting, man, I'm going to hustle. And, and as I hustle, things can increase. And as, as things increase, I'll actually have more time. Do you know you're going to have less time? And so you know what? My faith comes first. My relationship with Jesus comes first. Then my family. And this is a watch sitcom series. So you know inside of family what you need to value. Because faith always comes first then family, then friends, and then work. So I'm going to go really quick in this portion, all right? Really quick. So take notes. If you take notes, watch the rebroadcast as well. Matter of fact, I'm going to talk to future you. Future you, thank you so much for rewatching this broadcast on YouTube today. Now I want you to watch this. Oh, hey, okay, so here's some rules for cues. I want you to do three R's. I want you to remove, but you got to replace. I think sometimes in the Christian life, this is all we focus on. Just remove. Remove it, you know. But then we never replace it. And as we replace things, we got to rearrange some things. And every single time you remove something, replace something, or rearrange something, we have to ask, is this serving my values or am I serving it? Is this serving my values or is this, am I serving it? it. And so maybe it's the family value. And is this serving my family or am I serving whatever it is in my life? So I'm going to go out of order, okay? And the first one I'm going to talk about is family. And so with family, you may have to remove things that take you away from family. 
We have to say, you know what? Uh, and I'm not saying like, please, please do not misquote your pastor and quit your job tomorrow just so you can be with your family 24 seven. That's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's why you need to watch our last series called Boundaries. Boundaries. Some of you just burned the house down in your mind and you're waiting for that permission to go, ah, I can quit, you know, no, please. That's why we have mentors and small group leaders and people in this room that you could talk to today. But remove things that take you away from your family, but then you got to replace them, Re- replace them, replace them. We're like fighting back there, huh? Replace them with intentional family events. Like you schedule work every day from nine to five. Well, let's schedule family time. Let's schedule family dinner. And parents, can I tell you, uh, uh, if your child says, I really, really don't want to, that's not a good enough reason not to do it. Wow. Yeah. Or if they go, ugh, 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 ugh. I don't care. We have family dinner. Tonight's family dinner. You know what? We have family dinner Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. You know, it's whenever you can. But I say try at least to, fam- to plan an intentional family event no matter what. And there's a couple in our church. I love it. They got teenage kids. And then their families, they're like, we're at Disneyland. And their teenagers are like, Ugh. you know. <laughs> but I don't care what their attitude is. I care about what values you're instilling inside of them. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. They, they left, right? I think. But also you got to rearrange. So you replace things, but then you got to rearrange schedules and boundaries. Okay. Uh, how about this one? Friends. This could be a tough one. Friends. I'm going to get really spiritual on you. I'm going to show you uh, a Greek word. Uh, the Greek word is life sucking. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and life sucking is life sucking. <laughs> Remove life-sucking friendships. There's people in your life. Now, hear me out. There's a right way to do that, too. Not like your life-sucking, you know. I'm, you know, lose my number. But there are people that you, you, you can develop boundaries with and say, hey, this is my fence. This is my boundary. This is who I am. I don't want to be where you're at. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future, right? So I'm going to remove some life-sucking friendships. But here's the problem with this, though. The danger is, for some of us, we, maybe we, get, we, we, we come to Jesus Christ and we remove all outside influences, right? And there's a season for that. There's a season for you to dive into God's Word, get into a small group, serve at Avenue Church. There's seasons for those. But also, don't become so saved that you have no, no people around you that you can bring to church. You have no people around you that you can continue to do life with. And I love this. The danger is we socially disconnect. We say, forget it, I'm out of here. Socially disconnected people, according to a great article in The, uh, the Atlantic, it says this. He says they're less happy. Socially dis- isolated people, their health declines earlier in midlife. Their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives. Pastor Lindsay, I'm going to live forever. <laughs> And he says this, it is not just the number of friends you have. Listen to me, you can have lots of friends, but you can still be socially disconnected. You can be in a room full of people and you can still be all by yourself. It's the quality of your close relationships that matter. And that's my prayer at Avenue Church. I want you to have quality friendships and relationships at Avenue Church. Not just surface ones, right? But here's what I want you to know. You could still maintain all friendships, but some are deeper than others. Some are deeper than others. And so as I remove, and I'm talking about, don't, are you saved or unsaved? That's not the ones we touch, all right? Those are the ones we have influence, we love and minister to, but there's just some in your life that are life-sucking. And I want you to know, we replace with quality life-giving friendships with the same biblical values. Yes. Life-giving quality friendships with the same biblical values. But then you rearrange and schedule important relationships that are healthy that are healthy. You say, yes, I'll hang out with you, but I can only hang out with you until this time. Yeah. But yes, I can hang out. Yes, we can, we, yes, you are important and we have the same values. Yes, we can go on vacation together. Yes, we can do this and that. But I want you to know the most important element of gathering is its consistency. Don't get so wrapped up on the, on the how. I want you to get wrapped up in the why. Why? We're just spending time together. So there's, there's family, there's friends, but also there's faith, the faith value. And I want you to know if faith is a value, then it's a priority. It's a priority. 
Because before this slide, if we just said, you know, yeah, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna have values. You could pick up lots of values that won't necessarily help you or your walk with Jesus Christ. We can pick up values and things, but I want you to have some biblical values. And can I tell you, my values, right? My values, my faith drives my values. It's not my values tells my faith what to do. My faith helps me to define my values in this life. And can I tell you, uh, no matter where you're at in the, in the spiritual journey, my Bible, my word is the anchor to my soul, right? In the beginning was the word, word was God, the word, the word was God. The word helps me to define my values. And as I define my values, I have rules for cues, right? I have rules for triggers in my life. And as I have rules for triggers in my life, I say, God, it is not a bunch of do's and don'ts for me. It's God, I just want to be in your will. I want to be healthy. I want to be whole. I want to be holy. God, I want to, I want to be, hear your voice. I want to hear what God has for my life. And so many times we have to look at our values and say, is this value serving my faith or am I serving that value? Is this value serving my faith or am I serving it? And there's kind of three areas we talk about faith. It's time, treasure, talent. Time, treasure, talent. And I can go so much into time. Time is, yeah, it's, it's, it's being in church. Time is in my word every single day. Uh, time is praying to God, even though I don't know how to pray to God. I'm just going to have a conversation with God. Time is, I'm going to get my time to someone else in the church. I'm going to take someone else to, to lunch in this church. You know, get to know people in this church, a small group, uh, uh, serving, connect one day, uh, uh, all these different areas. But also my treasure. Treasure is, man, treasure is your, is your money. And time is also your treasure time and money and you know what my value is when I receive a paycheck I give 10% to the local church I give 10% back to God I give over and above and beyond why because it's my treasure and my talent I, I, I believe God gave us gifts and abilities for him for him and so what do I do with every single value Jesus comes first Jesus comes first and all of these areas and all my time and all my treasure and all my talent. And here's what Matthew 14 says. Jesus said to Peter, come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked down the water. But when he saw the winds of the waves, he was afraid. And then Jesus, he comes to him, right? Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand. And, and for me, I have a parent moment sometimes. Like, I told you, you know, like, I told you, let, let him sink a little bit more. But no, just Jesus immediately reached out his hand took a hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? There's two things that will happen. Because for many of us in this room, maybe the Holy Spirit is, is convicting you or what we say, maybe challenging you. And you're going, man, my priorities are out of whack. I'm here to, to tell you today, we serve a God of grace and mercy, right? And we're married to people that have grace and mercy. And we parent people that have grace and mercy. I'm going to help you change your mind about that right now in this moment. That they say, you know what? I don't want to be stuck in this cycle. Let's rearrange our values. Let's have biblical values in our life. But there's two things that can happen that when you get out of the boat. There's two things that can happen as you take a risk. And the first one is we step out and we risk our faith. Or we stay distracted and afraid. We just stay in the boat. And there's many options for us just to stay in the boat. The boat's comfortable. Yes, there's distractions. Yes, I'm triggered, but at least I'm in the boat. I want to live a life like Peter were. Man, my, my faith drives my values. And my values drives the triggers or the attractions or the distractions in my life. But can I encourage you today that when we take a big risk with our faith, distractions seem the most ready to derail us. The moment you raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to live in my heart. The moment you say, God, I, man, I, I'm ready to change my values. Maybe, maybe you're working too much. Maybe, maybe you're not reading your word or praying. Man, maybe, maybe you need to be in church every Sunday or you know, maybe, maybe you're at church once a month and say, hey, let's do every other. You know, maybe there's some values. You know, uh, maybe you're not giving or tithing and you want God to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing over your life. For God loves a cheerful giver. Whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is telling you today, the moment you walk out of this room, distractions, oh, they feel like they're ready. 
They feel like they go, ah, <laughs> and sometimes I, I believe that this, I, I shouldn't say this, right? But sometimes our kids can be a distraction. Things around us can be a distraction, but they seem the most ready to derail us. But here's what I want to touch on as, as our worship team, because I want well, you guys go ahead and come on up here. But it said, immediately Jesus reached out his hand. He took a hold of him saying, oh, you of little faith. Now, I've always read this and God's going, Why'd you doubt? Why? Why? Pulled him up and looked at him and said, Oh, ye of little faith, why'd you doubt? But as I read the scripture again in a different context, you know what he's really saying? He's really saying, Why'd you let the storm distract you? Because my Bible says, If I fix my eyes on Jesus, he's the author and the perfecter of my faith. faith. Author and perfecter of, our, of my faith faith. And that faith can look different for every single person in this room today. Faith, when you took, when your step of faith is going to look a whole lot different than my step of faith. And can I tell you, that's awesome. That's incredible. I think that's amazing because every single person in this room, we're all on a different uh, journey in the faith journey. But can I tell you that anytime we allow the storm to distract us, it's happened to the best of us. It's happened to all of us. It happens to your pastor. Sometimes I get so distracted by, by not missing God that I feel like I miss God. Ah, oh, Jesus, you know, God's like, I'm right here. But when we allow the storm to distract us, some of us defer our celebrations and our happiness and joy because of a few bad turns that we've experienced in the past. That maybe you took a step of faith and whatever that journey looked like for you. And he said, Lord, help me, and he helped you. But man, you're stuck in that moment now. The enemy seeks to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But he comes to steal, to kill, and to distract. And what he loves to do is he loves to bring shame. And can I tell you, shame is the enemy of values. For many of us in this room, we say, yes, I want, yes, I want, I want to have faith and I want to have godly biblical values and I want to do all this. And then shame comes in and you go, I, but I, I can't because of, and I won't because last time I did, maybe it's anger. And because of them and because of this. And shame is the enemy of our values. And my friend, Bob Goff, he's like the happiest person on this planet. All right, if you ever read his books, but he says, shame keeps us behind walls that we have constructed to keep everybody out. You know, even for me, we spent a couple of days with our team, with Kimberly Malloy. And she said, what's your, here's a whole paper of values and we just check mark, you know. And Pastor Lindsay, she was like meticulous in her values. You know what I mean? I was like, yes, 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 yes. All of them, I want all the value. You get a value, I get a value, everyone gets a value. <laughs> but finally, after a lot of prayer, I said, you know what? Because values, they tend to change over seasons. I'm not saying the, the faith and family and friends and work values. Sometimes you have that personal value in your life. Or maybe in, in this room, it's faith. Faith needs to become a value. I value my faith. I value my relationship with Jesus Christ. When I go to work, they, they will know I'm a Christian. Not because, of, not because I scream it out. Not because I'm preaching the gospel but by my, by my actions and by my life. And for me, I really had to pray and God gave me the value of just, just confident, confidence. And I, I don't have self-esteem issues. I don't have none of those things, okay? Come on. When I look, at, look in the mirror, I say, you did make a masterpiece, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I was fearfully and wonderfully made. Probably a little bit more fearfully. <gasps> but for me, it was confidence. Confidence in being able to get out of the boat. Because for 20 some years, I, I got out of the boat several times and, and began to immediately sink. And say, God, I thought it was you. I thought. And because of those moments, I let it stop my faith. And so my, I said, this is, I have a value of, of confidence because I refuse to be kept in shame. And emotionally 
healthy spirituality, if we chronically neglect our values, if we become something we're not proud of, our lives feel out of balance. And we, we seek distractions to escape our shame and our dissatisfactions. Here's what I want you to see today as I try to land this message today. And I want to, I want to pray for you today. I believe the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 14, verse 32, and said, and when Jesus and Peter got back to the boat, I was almost to say, then the wind ceased. I believe the Holy Spirit showed me that Peter walked on water, saw the distractions, began to sink, and then Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Now, I don't think Jesus went like this and went, oh, Peter. But I believe, I believe, this is my belief. I believe Jesus pulled them back out. Because yeah. my Bible says he doesn't drag us. My Bible says he pulls us. Yeah. He pulls us out. And then they perhaps, theologians agree with me, all right? Perhaps they both walk back to the boat. We always discount when Peter sank, but we... We, we never think about Peter linking, maybe holding hands, holding on to Jesus, like, I ain't doing this again, you know. But they both walked back to the boat, and then after they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those in the boat, they weren't afraid. They didn't go, Peter walked on water. They worshiped him, saying, truly, you're the son of God. Can I just encourage you guys? Jesus is the remedy. He really is the remedy. He is the remedy. Don't be distracted by shame. In Romans chapter 10, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame will not be put to shame. Romans chapter five, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance, character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Friends, I'm telling you, you can come to Jesus. Friends, I'm telling you, you can rearrange your values and reprioritize so that Jesus is number one in your life. So you don't give in to distractions, but you now have traction towards the things of God. So that you know who you are in Christ Jesus because your life is too valuable. Your calling is too great. Your God is too good for you to be distracted by shame. Yeah. By shame. And so will you stand with me, please? I'd love to pray with you today. And man, I just want to rebuke any distractions in your life that are keeping you from your faith value. That is keeping you from a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we bow our heads, close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this room today. The Father, in just a moment, I want us to, I want us to honor this distracted series. And Father, I want us to eliminate all distractions right now in this room. Distractions of, of whatever it is, kids, cell phone devices, what we're, gonna, what, what we're gonna do when we leave Avenue today the plans that I have. Father, I ask you to give us a moment to be able to identify the shame, the winds, and the waves that are distracting us, that are pulling us down, that are weighing us down. But Father, I thank you that you can carry the weight for us. Father, I thank you that you can remove shame from us. Father, I thank you that you love the spiritual journey that we're on. Father, I thank you that you didn't, you didn't yell at Peter, but you were identifying with Peter, saying, why'd you doubt? You could do so much more. Keep your eyes on Jesus. So never have ever head bowed of eye closed. I just want you to, I'll ask you today, will you put your hands out as a posture, just surrender, and just say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Before I go back out into the busyness of this world, man, before I, all, all the different things, we just give God just a moment during this worship song. Go ahead, worship team. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. I thank you there's no condemnation. 
to those who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you I can be set free today. In Jesus' name. Just take a moment.
every hand up, 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 up high saying, Father, I surrender. Holy Spirit, I pray supernaturally speak to us today. Guide us and lead us and heal us and restore us. In Jesus' name, begin to do a work inside of our hearts today. Give us clarity today where we have to open our hearts. This is the moment of traction that we need. The Holy Spirit, speak to me. Come on, worship team, just sing that chorus. I am available for just a moment. today and you say, I want Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I want you to just raise a hand and kind of wave it at me. Just wave it at me. Just wave it at me because the Holy Spirit, he's doing something. He's doing something powerful, right? Just wave it at me. Just wave it at me and say, I want Jesus in my life. Come on. That's a lot of hands. And so I encourage you, I'm going to pray. We're going to have a host moment uh, come up. But I want you to, after the host moment, you can stay as long as you'd like. And our worship team will continue to play. And man, I just want you to enter in and to say, Jesus, guide me, lead me, save me, restore me. But I give you all shame. I give you all condemnation, regret. I give it all to you for God's praise and God's glory. So everybody in this house, lift your voice. Say, dear Jesus, say thank you for dying on the cross. Say thank you for paying for what I did. So Jesus, I repent of my sins. Say, be Lord of my life. Say, the best way I know how, I'm going to live for you. Say, I now know who I am. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm a child of God. Come on, everybody, give God a shout today. Come on.